Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Trophy and it's a babbling Belgian and welcome back to Gwenta G Show where we talk about interesting decks to play around with and after the three kind of meta decks that we did over the past few weeks, I thought it was time for something a little bit different but still went into the new leader cards and for that reason in particular we will be looking at Skellige today and the amazing Pirates deck. So pirates and ships were an underappreciated archetype before and also an under developed archetype before but now we've gotten a bit more support for it in patch 8.3 um, this deck is specifically trained to actually take advantage of those new abilities and those new cards but i also need to state this at the beginning of this video this is still not a very completely competitive meta deck as you've seen it's not appearing in any snapshots uh, but still it's a very fun archetype to work with it's not uber powerful but it doesn't have to be it's still workable against a lot of the archetypes you can still manage your opponent and it's still something that is competitive to my mind just not the best meta deck out there so if you're just here to take a look at how this deck functions, go ahead and skip to the example matches because uh, that's where the fun stuff is. And before we go into that, I'm going to just go through the entire deck, show you all the cards that are in there and what they can do, especially in conjunction with each other. And we actually start with a card that has had its ability changed. The Dimmon Warship has changed to a 4 power, 4 provision bronze card that right now, it already was that, but it did 3 damage normally. So it changed its ability to whenever you play a pirate, damage self and a random enemy unit by 1, which is not much on its own, but when it dies, it summons a random bronze pirate from the graveyard to this row. It's an important ability because that will come back in how we chose the pirates in this deck. Because because it's choosing randomly, you don't know what you're going to get, so you want to get your strongest bronze pirates as possible. So I didn't include certain other bronze pirates just because of their low uh, power. But this can be extremely powerful. If you manage to kill it, you can actually pull out like a 6-point Uncrate Raiders with 2 damage, a 7-point Tuyasak Veteran, or a 7-point Dimmon Pirate. So this could technically be up to 12 points if played correctly, which is why it's in this deck. It's not always the easiest card to pull off, but it is very satisfying to use as a only a 4 provision bronze, so keep that in mind. Then, as I said, the Tweersark Invader, they have 5 power as a base, but gain 1 power at the end of every round. So uh, if you use her in round 3, you get a 7 power unit on the board. Also with Veil, so can be Poison Bleeding or something like that. Then once Fallblood Priest, usually used to um, either hit Blue Boy Lugos or the Demon Warship as some extra self damage. It's not much, but it's only used uh, once in this deck just to be able to have a backup in case your leader ability disappears. Because the leader ability is actually Earth Sign Ritual, which allows you to hit one of your own units by one five times and then when you're done with that you get a six point bear abomination on your side of the field we'll talk about that leader ability a bit later on then we have the uncrate raiders also pirates start at four uh points but they have also veteran which means that again they also go up by one at the end of each round so at the end it will be he will be worth six points and he has an order ability that damages a unit by two which gains zeal if you have three uh bleed well damage units on the other side of the board so bloodthirst tree usually doesn't trigger so you just have an order ability of two damage you can use in the next turn then a double uncrate longship um it's a classic in scalagus so of four points one armor and if he's on the melee row you actually uh get a sort of damage buff because every time your opponent plays a unit with that uh, longship on the board you hit that unit by one just Every single unit that gets played on the board gets hit, which can be very powerful. Then the Dimmon Pirate starts at a whopping 7 power for only 5 provisions, but has a kind of detrimental deploy ability, move the top card from your deck to your graveyard, but this ability is cancelled if you control a ship, so just a very high power um, unit that doesn't really do anything, but especially at the beginning it's good to get some tempo with only a simple bronze card. There's also a single stunning blow in here, just giving you a bit of direct removal. So 5 damage or 6 if the unit you are targeting has armor. Jenge is also another part of our removal tactics. 
allowing you to lock an enemy unit as long as there's at least one damage unit on the other side of the board. And he also has a whopping seven power. So giving you just seven power and a lock. So he definitely benefited from the lock buffs in uh, patch 8.3. Then continuing the team of um, pirates and ships, we have the Terror of the Sea. Starts at 5 power with 2 armor, has zeal, and his order ability is lose all armor and damage an enemy unit by that amount. And whenever you play a pirate, this unit also gains another armor point. It is, you can use that to damage immediately because of course he has two armor, you can immediately damage something by two, but if you keep it on the board that will just keep going up. And it's something that your opponent doesn't really want to waste damage on, um, because it doesn't really block anything. You use the damage to get rid of the armor, which would have been used to deal damage anyway. So you're never really losing points even if you leave this on the board, because it's otherwise taking the damage for you. Then Joanna is not a card that I've seen a lot of people use, but Joanna, I've said this before, is a very um, underrated card. So 5 power, 7 provisions, but on order she has a healing ability, allowing her to heal an allied unit by 2, which is important. So healing is good, healing is nice, uh, and she has one charge of this at the beginning, but she gains an extra charge whenever an adjacent unit takes damage. Which uh, allows us to talk about the next unit immediately, which is Blue Boy Lugals, who, whenever he takes damage, damages a random enemy unit by two in return. So if you put Blue Boy Lugals next to Joanna, you play Joanna first, then Blue Boy Lugals, you can hit Blue Boy Lugals with your Ursan Ritual charges as much as you want, and then heal that off with Joanna, and even keeping a few extra charges to heal anything else you want to heal. This is not the sort of deck that boosts, and there's actually a very peculiar reason for that as well. Another card that not a lot of people use, and you may want to replace if you're looking to make this even more competitive, but uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Now next up we have our first tutor, Raiding Fleet. It gives an enemy unit bleeding for 4 turn, and then play a random bronze ship from your deck. Keep in mind to not do this too early in this deck, because it could uh, actually take the Demon Warship as well, and if there's no bronze pirates in your uh, graveyard just yet, that ability is kind of wasted. But it, again, it can pull the Uncreate Longships as well, um, which is obviously what you're going for. You can kind of play with that with your mulligans as well to know what you're kind of going to get with the Raiding Fleet. Then Holger Blackhand, another pirate. So on deploy he damages a unit by two, but whenever you play a ship afterwards you boost that ship by one, and whenever you play a pirate with him on the board you deal one damage to a random enemy unit, um, which is a good little engine that gives you eight points for his eight provisions as, provisions as a base, but then just gives you more and more depending on which cards you play. Which could come in handy sometimes, especially on the long ships. Keeping them alive with that extra point is sometimes really handy, because otherwise they get hit with something as simple as a 5 damage special card. Then, something you definitely need in this meta is some row damage. And I feel like Surrender fits really, really well in this deck, because this deck isn't really... Um, it's, it's working towards building armor up for, your, oh, for yourself, but not being able to deal with the armor of your opponent all that well. So Surrender kind of remedies that and removes two armor from all units in a row and then damages them by two. So any protection is immediately wiped away. It, this is really good against dwarves, really good against Araka Swarm just because of the amount of units that's on the field. And there's a lot of swarming decks these days and this is the perfect counter to that. Then we get our Defender, the Covenant of Steel, allows you to block a row from being targeted and of course is a pirate as well. And at 6 power this unit gains an automatic point of armor in, at the end of your turn, which could make it a very good target for your Svalblood Priest in case you don't have any target or just to get rid of your remaining Urstein Ritual Charges if you don't have a, a very useful target for that. Then, the unit that I wanted to talk about, the Dire Bear. I, there's not a lot of people that are fans of the Dire Bear. I am. Um, there's a very good reason for this. This blocks all the boosting on its row and the opposite row. So you need to make sure that it's on a row that your opponent wants to automatically start boosting. Again, very powerful against dwarves if you know where to put it. But it's also very powerful against monsters, because monsters tend to boost a lot because of consumes. And this just blocks an entire row of consuming or of thriving as long as the Dire Bear is on that row. So especially against monsters, a very, 
very powerful card that can't be underestimated because it is a powerhouse against monsters. I have beaten uh, Videx with this deck, which is uh, yeah very fitting, I would say. Just the, the Vikings, the pirates being able to also function as monster slayers. Then we get to our three biggest heavy hitters. Steric V is first another pirate that also has veteran starts at five, so can end up at seven power. And on deploy, you give an enemy unit rupture, which is a status that is unique to Steric V, meaning that at the end of your opponent's next turn, the unit that has been inflicted with rupture will damage itself by its own base power. So very important to keep that in mind. It's the base power, not the current power. And it doesn't, uh, it's not penetrating damage, so you also need to keep in mind that armor will block some of the damage as well. But very powerful finishing card, especially because it already has seven uh, base power as well by the end of the match, which could come in really, really handy. And for your other needs we have another pirate morgvark heart of terror you probably know this card starts at five power one armor and on deploy you damage an enemy unit by one and you keep doing that until that unit is damaged so meaning it takes care of any armor and it takes care of all boosts which could be devastating to cards like cleaver cleaver dies immediately um what else uh, colgrim also dies immediately Wygern dies immediately. There's a few cards that are really, really vulnerable to just this card because it hits, it keeps hitting until that unit is damaged. So anything that relies on armor or very, very big boosts can be destroyed this way. And now we have the big man himself, Krach Ancrate. One of the new leader cards, well, the reintroduced leader cards also starts at seven power, but doesn't have veterans, so he just has seven power. And on deploy, you give two armor to three pirates or ships in your hand. So you need to play this rather early. You might want to defend this card with a Covenant of Steel as well, but it's a bit of a trade-off. You also might want to use Covenant of Steel on this next to Krach, because Krach has a very powerful passive effect. Because whenever you play a pirate or ship next to Krach, you damage that unit and the lowest power enemy unit by each other's powers. For example, if you... what's a good example here? Yeah, the, the Dimmon Warship. So the Dimmon Warship has four power. If you play that right next to Krach, and your opponent, for example, has a two power token on the field, you damage that two power token by four because of the Dimmon Warship, and then the Dimmon Warship by two because of the power of the token. So they trade off, but of course the Dimmon Warship has a Death Wish ability, so you could technically immediately kill it with that ability while also dealing damage and getting another pirate back from your graveyard. So that's the very powerful combo with Krog, and because of the fact that Krog gives your units armor, you also have a bit of extra protection from his own effect. So those two points of armor you give to those units technically also translate into damage right away, uh, as long as Krog stays alive, of course, which is not always that easy to do, uh, which is why this deck might sometimes be not that powerful, just because Krog is pretty vulnerable, even though it's a very good card. And then the final card is our final tutor, the Blood Eagle Echo card. You damage an enemy unit by two and then play a warrior from your deck with a provision cost of seven or less. But if you kill something with that two power, you play a warrior from your deck regardless. Um, so you can choose what the provision is. If it's Blood Thirst 3 on your opponent's side on the board, you can just choose anything as well. Now the only thing that's annoying uh, is that a few cards lost their warrior attack. So the only really big warriors that you still have left are Tyrk V. Covenant of Steel and then uh, Blue Boy Lugals, which is what I usually use it for because Blue Boy Lugals is vital for your leader ability. So you can pull that with Blood Eagle. It, Blue Boy has seven provisions, so even if you can't kill anything, you can pull Blue Boy with Blood Eagle. And there's a lot of bronze warrior cards. The other pirates actually kept their um, warrior attacks, so the raiders still are warriors, and the Tweersock invaders are also. Warrior, so that should still make it nine points at least for your uh, Blood Eagle. And that is the deck. Um, I also went for Crystal Skull just because it's a bit better at protecting something uh, against Nilfgaard as well. So that's the deck. So let's go into an example match. And it sounds like we're heading into battle against Nilfgaard. Yeah, the dreaded double cross decks that we're seeing constantly. I don't know if you guys are seeing that constantly, but it's... One of the most uh, used leader abilities these days. There's a lot of locking, a lot of annoying um, blockage there. But this is actually a pretty good starting hand. I don't have the defender just yet. I don't see a really good use for Joanna just yet with the cards that we have. And a double Demon Warship might be a bit too much. 
So let's get rid of one of those as well. And now we get, okay, the Terror of the Seas. So Double Cross usually also has Masquerade Balls these, these days because, um, well, Nilfgaard players are really peculiar. They go for Double Cross because the provision um, bonus you get is the highest of all the Nilfgaard leader abilities. It still gives you possibly a very good card. And of course, Masquerade Ball costs a lot, so you need those extra provisions to include Masquerade Ball. Kind of, yeah, offsetting the problem with Masquerade Ball. Okay, so we start with Artorias Vigo, which is probably gonna get... That was a really weird first start. Thank you, can we have her to her health? Um, I could start bleeding... Doesn't really matter at this point. I'm gonna just start bleeding. I'm probably gonna grab. Oh, okay. That was yeah. That was one chance in three, which is why I kept one of those warships in my hand. That's too bad, but it's not uh, that much of a problem. I'm hoping he might actually lock that because right now it's useless. I don't have any pirates in my graveyard yet, so the warship is not gonna really do anything here. It's kind of the only card in the deck right now, which might be a bit weird to play. Um, you already need to have something in your graveyard for this to work and you don't have any control of over when it will actually trigger. He's... my opponent is overplaying here. Artorius and Bratens in the first round. That is... interesting. I think I'm just gonna go with... a Raiders. Yeah, let's just start with a Raiders. And that will actually trigger the ability of the Demon Warship, even though it's not actually doing much Otherwise, we'll still get a bit of damage out of it. We got Hunting Pack. It's not really doing... We're probably going to get locked on the Radies. I think I saw it being selected there. Ooh, we didn't. We didn't actually get selected. That is interesting. I could get locked on the Terror of the Seas. I think I'm just going to play the Demon Pirate first, just because it has such of a high uh, power cap there. And then I'm just going to kill uh, Artorias in the back there. So he doesn't keep going with the assimilate triggers. I'm just going to keep this low. Our opponent already wasted two gold cards. So I don't see why I should overplay. And that is actually really good. That is actually really good. I'm going to play Tire of the Seas now. And then let it hit immediately. Yeah, I don't see why not. So let's just hit Bratens. And next up, we're probably going to get poisoned on the Demon Pirate, which loses us seven points. There we go, we get a poison there. The sad thing is, is that I don't immediately have... It is actually locking that one. Hmm, you know what, I can still handle this. Let's just play another pirate. Because it looks like we're 13 points behind, but of course we're going to get the extra two damage on the Uncreate Raider. Which is two. And now... Yeah, so they killed... This is what I wanted to show. So it, they killed the Demon Pirate, which is seven points. The Warship that I still have on my field damages itself by one every time you play a Pirate. I have a few more Pirates in my hands. Uh, there's a few strong ones in there, but I'm going to go for Morgvark regardless. Um, so this triggers the warship, and what's going to happen is the warship is going to die. I'm going to pull the demon pirate back from the graveyard. So this is a pretty powerful play and enough to get us over. There we go. And that got us back to seven points, and that called us up in one go. I did play one of my gold cards here, but it was uh, very well worth it. So I think with double cross ball, I pretty much want to push. Just so we can take out anything that comes across our board. The Demon Warship is very powerful here. As well as basically everything else in our hands. I think I'm going to get rid of Surrender. Okay, we get another pirate ship. We don't get a Defender. But even without the Defender, I think it's worth playing Krog. Because Krog is 7 points. We can add some more armor to our units. Yeah, I'm definitely going to play him. Um, so, let's start with Croc. He probably is going to get locked. I feel like he's going to get locked. But it is what it is. So let's armor up the... Hmm. Yeah, let's armor up the warship. Um, Tirk V and Holger Blackhand. 
And that should be it. So the warship is obvious. I want to protect it just a little bit, but then also use its secondary ability because the units that are actually resurrected by the warship don't get doomed. So again, there's a lock. Um, so that means that we can pull that seven point pirate out of our deck once again, if we want to. Um, do I play? I, the reason why I didn't give this armor is because I'm going to just play it now. Yeah, so let's put that on the board. I want to keep this rather short the next round. I'm actually... I think I might actually be able to win this. I just want to bleed out the Masquerade Ball. Because I'm pretty sure there's going to be a Masquerade Ball. And I won't be able to kill the Demon Warship here, so... Let's just play Holger Blackhand. And put another hit on the Slave Hunter over there. And we get hit on Croc, of course, because Croc is the only one that has no armor anymore. Now we get Roderick of the Untine, giving us an extra gold card. And that gold card is Coup de Grasse. Coup de Grasse onto Roderick again, most likely, because everything else hasn't been uh, damaged all too much. So this is still a zero-sum operation. Again, another gold card. And that is Joachim. So, Joachim, that's sad that we don't have the uh, Morgvark anymore, because this is going to be... Ooh, Vincent from Mordheim onto Croc, I suppose. Yeah, there we go. And that still didn't give them the benefit there. Okay, I'm going to play slow here. So, let's play the Demon Warship. You will get boosted by one because of Holger Blackhand, and we can just keep going. So now I'm kind of forcing their hand. If they think that I'm gonna stop it here, then they're gonna have to use double cross now. Why would you poison that? So that's something you don't want to do. Um, there's nothing to lock, there's nothing to... Yeah, I'm just gonna go all out now. So let's use Blue Boy Lugos and hit him. Ah, that's annoying. That's lost me a point. And that's another hit. And that's another hit. And that's another hit. There we go. And that's how you want to use your Ursine Ritual charges. So getting us ahead a little bit. Next up is going to be Tirgvi. Which is going to be another pirate. And remember, if the Demon Warship dies, we're just going to get another pirate back. So we got the Nozga Sergeant. And now we get... Ooh, yeah, okay. So now they're going to use Double Cross. And we get Tirgvi. So Tirgvi is going to go on to... Yeah, the Bear Abomination. That kind of makes sense. So that is that. I'm going to use Tirgvi again. Uh, as well, I mean. Or do I use... Hmm. So I can use Chang'e now first to... Um, Lock the Nausicaa Sergeant. So there we go. And that kills the Bear Abomination. Still 12 points ahead, but it's starting to get close here. So there we got Cantarella. Okay, fair enough. And that's gonna grab... Oh, wow. Oh, wow, that was... That was lucky. Just, just give me a good target to... Uh, to put Rupture on, though. That's another 5 damage. Would have been the same on Tirgvi. So let's just use Tirgvi on that. You have my sword. There we go. Time. And we get double hits just because of the random damage picks that we're getting. So the one of them came from the Demon Warship and the other one came from Holger Blackhand. So 13 points ahead. And we might have actually gotten it here. So Masquerade Ball is going to be pretty useless. So that's why I wanted to push. That card is out of their deck now. And yep, yeah, there we go. You push against Double Cross, you push, especially with this deck. We just won against Double Cross Masquerade Ball, so that was uh, very nice. Let's do another one. Okay, next one is against Skellige itself, and it looks like a Battle Trance deck. Is that going to be Pirates as well, but then with Battle Trance instead of Ursine Ritual, which is what we're doing? It might be, you know, it actually might be. Um, we don't need a double Longship, and we don't need double Raiders, so... That's a good mulligan as a start. Um, do we use Joanna? I can't see a use for Joanna just yet. We don't have the priest, we don't have blue boy. So let's keep it simple for now. 
Um, and just start with the Uncreate Longship. Do I need to? No. I'm just going to use the Uncreate Longship as a start because it's always a good st start to a match just to have that extra damage going on the field. But Battle Trance, so that's usually Druids. And it seems to be Druids indeed. Interesting. Um, I'm going to play Holger Blackhand now. We have a good hand. In regards to that, so let's just start killing animals on the other side of the field. Killing them ravens. And uh, just keep that nice and clean. We don't want to have too many uh, pests on the other side of the board. Just spoiling the point total a little bit. So the Twirstock Bear Mask is going to put some vitality on the uh, raven. Which is good, because I'm going to actually use... Yeah, Raiding Fleet to put that uh, vitality out of the way and it's more efficient that way you immediately remove value and you add bleeding on top of it so now we have two on create long ships and it gets boosted by a whole good black hand so nothing wasted and that is just very very clean and we get a boss immediately that is interesting so that means that we should actually push next round wow okay that was apparently aggressive enough for our opponent to say, fuck it, we won't be able to do anything against that. Which is something that happens if you play a double longship. We got kind of lucky that it was the longship, kind of contrary to the first match that we played where we pulled the Demon Warship on 30% chance. And that was the other way around, we pulled the longship on a 30% chance. Okay, we get the Priest, but the Priest is useless right now. We want to focus on... Ooh, that is really good. The Dire Bear is really good against the Druid deck. Because that's what the Druid wants to do. He wants to boost. They want to boost. And we're not going to let them boost. So let's just get rid of that Stunning Blow. We get another Raider. Okay, okay. This is starting to get really interesting. Um, I'm going to be really aggressive. I'm going to play Krog from the get-go. So Krog. Armor up. So definitely Tire of the Seas. And then it doesn't really matter. Our Demon... Uh, warships are not in our hands, so that's not something we can deal with. We can add one on the Demon Pirate and then I suppose on Morgfark since he has armor already. So that's going to come in more handy. So that is Croc's ability. Let's see if we can pull this out. If we get Gathernate, we know which row that we need to target here. And we get Karate Heatwave, that was to be expected as well. Not that much of a problem. Um, let's then just slowly start out with the Raiders. Do I do Raiders? Or do I do Terror of the Seas? Terror of the Seas is now up to 4 armor. As long as that keeps, yeah, not being touched, it doesn't really matter. Because, as I said, he blocks. If you don't use the armor, it's gonna get destroyed by your opponent, but then your opponent uses damage to actually get rid of that armor. Kind of negating the equation a little bit. So either you use it to deal damage or you use it as protection as it is actually normally used, armor. And we get the Covenant of Steel back in our face. Which is absolutely fine because that means that our opponent is most likely going to be row stacking. So they're going to be putting a lot of units on that row, including probably Ganadid. Ganadid? Ganadid. Um, which is not a problem at all, so let's just put down some more pirates. Because you know, this is a pirate stack, we're gonna just be playing a lot of pirates. No, no, I don't know if you've been counting, but I am actually in the possibility here to take out the defender. Because if I now play Morgvark on the defender, he will put the Covenant of Steel down to 6. And the Terror of the Seas will gain another um, armor point, giving him 6 damage on that armor. But that's not what we're going to do. We're just going to slowly build this up. Because we, we have the advantage. We won that first round, so now we're just going to push. We have, Even if we lose this round, we still have that first round in the back. So there's no point in us not doing this. There's still a lot of powerful cards in our uh, deck as well. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Just wait this out slowly. So same with the Raiders. We're just going to put those Raiders on there. Because that's exactly what they're going to do. There's just passive damage on the board. We're going to store that and just unleash that all in one go in a minute. And then we get on Aeromancy. And on Aeromancy is going to pull... Ooh, decoction, the Giga Scorpion decoction on one of our uh, like 
our raid is there. There was nothing damaged yet, so they didn't get the extra bonus there. Hmm. They're kind of forcing our hand a little bit here, but... I don't mind. I can kill the defender in one go now, but I don't really want to do that just yet. Hmm. I could kill the Covenant of Steel with just a little bit of damage now. And I could use the lock later on. I could break the armor... And just play... I'm going to do that. Just play another... Um, I can actually play Blue Boy Lugals here. Just play Blue Boy Lugals. And start hitting him with a bit of damage. And that is... Absolutely fine. I'm going to keep it at that. I don't want to overdo it. I don't want to overspend. Because overspending is where you lose. So just slowly. Easy does it. Where's the get beneath? And there's a get it. Okay, that's really good. So that's what we wanted to see. So that is only the druid over there. I could take out the defender now, but I want to see what they're going to do. Okay, I could use surrender now. But I'm going to have to kill the defender if I do that. Hmm. <laughs> that now there's something damaged. Yeah, I'm just gonna put I'm gonna put the dire bear in the back. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I wanna I know there's a Draco Turtle still in there somewhere, so. Do I just take out Can I take out? I can take out. Yeah, I'm gonna take out the Covenant of Steel now. Damage the preacher over there, and then just drain the remaining charges on Blue Boy, hopefully hitting the No, we're not, and we killed the cl the crow mother again. Uh, wait, didn't I play a card? I, I played a card, right? No, I didn't play a card. Okay, let's just let's just surrender the whole thing now. <laughs> there we go. That, that's that's done. I think I might have overplayed a little bit now. I can still lock the next one. So yeah, that's another Crow Clan Preacher. There's going to be a bunch of crows on the field now. And that's going to boost the... Yeah, one of the crows. I'm bringing back that one. Okay. So let's just lock that one over there now. And there's another preacher. There is another preacher. So the murderum goes onto the crow mother. And that gets them over. Do I want to play the dire bear in the back? I think I do. I want to keep the dire bear for the Draco turtle. No, I'm going to I'm going to do this. Okay. So now that Preacher can't boost anymore. Okay, and there's Ceres. Ceres putting down... What is that? Okay. I mean, I could use Morgvark now. But it's not that good of a card at the moment. And if there's a Draco Turtle in there... Yeah, I'm gonna have to pass. That is annoying. Okay. All right, let's see what that final round is going to do for us. We still have Tyrk V. If we can grab him, probably with Blood Eagle should be able to do that. Uh, and otherwise, we might actually pull him. Seven points, seven points. No. Okay, so that's another pirate. Might as well get rid of that. I'm not going to be able to kill this warship, so that's not going to help. And we get the defender again. Okay. And we get Gremist as a first play. So you can purify. Not you again. So let's use the Twirsock Invader first, since there's no, no real point to her anyway. So seven points and that's it. You, what you see is what you get. And then of course gets purified. We get a Savage Bear with some bleeding. Was there one down already? No, so that's just only that. So I'm gonna keep a Morgvark as the last play, obviously. I'm gonna put down the defender next. So that's 14 points, well now only 13 because of the bloody bear. So I'm hoping there's a Draco Turtle in the end there, but if they still have Sigdrifas right, they can resurrect. They can resurrect the defender first before they go with Draco Turtle. And that is gonna hurt if that happens. And we get, ooh, the bear master. Okay. Um. I wasn't expecting that. 
So we don't have Bloodthirst at the moment. So I'm gonna have to grab just something else with, uh, and that's something else. Yeah, it's definitely gonna be another tourist arc invader. And not tier V, sadly. Um, Cause I can't waste, yeah, I can't waste more Quark here. So let's just use two damage on Grammys to put another tourist arc invader down. Put that over here in the back. And then we're gonna get... So the Battle Trance still needs to hit, but the Battle Trance we can completely negate with Morgfark. And if it is the Draco Turtle, then yeah, we can immediately just neutralize it with uh, Morgfark. And we get a connection issue here, which is weird. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Come on. Tablet, please work. Come on, put it down. There's not much to do here. You just play your final card and put something. Oh, ho, 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 ho. I was expecting that. There was. I had a feeling that was going to be it. So. Um. So, Grammar starts at six, the bear at four. So, that's only two damage. So, I need to put Morgvark on Grammar. And we just barely had that. Wow. Okay. That was good. That was good. Versus Skellige as well. So there we go. So there we go. Two matches against some pretty decent decks on pro rank that we won against with these lovely pirates and ships. Which is... I mean, to my mind, I feel like a lot of people are saying that this isn't a strong archetype. But still, we just won against Double Cross with Masquerade Ball and we won against um, Druids which is Battle Trans Druids, which is really, really good, because those guys can go really high in point total. We saw that in that second round there, but we pulled out the win in the final round regardless. So this is the deck list. You can check it out at the Plague Went website. There's a few uh, replacements you could do. I know the Dire Bear is a really, yeah, big novelty. So you can maybe swap him out for something uh, that is in his provision range, like for example, I mean, even Harold Houndsnout would be really good in this deck because you can use him if you don't have any other options anymore to just take out the Demon Warships and get your pirates back. But other than that, yeah, there's just a lot of good cards. You could even just go with a Curse of Corruption to have another high, um, well, just big heavy hitter, a, a tall removal card in your deck. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of good cards that you could also use as replacement for Dire Bear. But again, there's a lot of people that don't expect the Dire Bear. I've seen a lot of misplays against this deck just because of them playing a unit that boosts itself when it's played on the road that the Dire Bear was still on. So it's, it's a very cool card that uh, can have its good uses regardless of what you saw just now. Because it was limited here, but against monsters this is very, very good. But again, this is the deck list. Let me know what you think of this deck because um, it's really open to improvements. But it's a very good basis to work from because it has a lot of tools that you can use to your advantage. Either just for your sake or to destroy your opponent's units. So let me know what you think. Because we're already at the end of the episode once again. So sadly, time flies when you're having fun. Because this deck is exactly that. I know a few of my previous deck guides were more the standard deck guides for very powerful meta decks. This was not it. This was, again, one of those fun decks that is not something you see a lot of in the meta. But still is very viable. Which is, uh, I'm hoping, what you guys come here for to see. So thank you guys. It's normally for watching and for the support as always because uh, I've seen a lot of new people joining the channel and it is really really appreciated check out the deck at the playground website the link is in the description um, and give it an upvote over there as well because I can use all the support I can get and uh, yeah if you want to talk to me just do so in the comment section down below I'm here to help again because that's what we're here for just to help each other out giving tips all around so everybody has a very good and fine experience with this lovely game. So thank you guys enormously for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode of Grand Edge. Stay nerdy and thanks for watching. Goodbye. Yeah,